Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And I must emphasize that it is indeed a good afternoon. On behalf of Stardia, Okay, take two, as they say. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And as I said earlier, it is indeed a very good afternoon. On behalf of Stadia, I want to wish all of you a very warm welcome, especially to those of you who joined us at the Centurion campus and to the 637 people who are participating online. To the persons online, I want to say, I'm sorry you couldn't join us for lunch, but I sincerely hope that you will experience some of the excitement and the anticipation that is in the room this afternoon. Would I be wrong were I to say, South Africa is not a country in isolation. We must realize that the world is changing and that we must adapt or be left behind. The future challenges are manifold, with global policy uncertainty impacting on our often short-term policy decisions. Well, I wish I could claim those words as my own, but they're not mine. They were spoken by Dr. Matthew Sporza at the National Business Convention in 2014. But you will all agree that they are just as appropriate a consideration for today. There is little doubt that we're living in an age of disruption. Climate change, technology, increasing violence, political instability, changing values, and in some instance, no values amongst the so-called leading elite. And now more than ever, we need good people, not just with new ideas. Now more than ever, we need good people with new ideas who are prepared to stand up for them. We are in desperate need of provocative thought leaders who are prepared to speak out and to fight the debilitating scourge of groupthink. However, like you and me, these people sometimes have bad ideas, they have doubts, and they have fear. But what sets them apart is that they choose to act. Dr. Matthew Sposa is one such individual. But the more important question is, are you? Well, I believe that you are. The very fact that you are here this afternoon in the venue and online means that you do not want to be just one of the masses sitting and waiting for someone else to make a difference, waiting for others to make things change. And for that, we salute you. Ladies and gentlemen, I said this afternoon was going to be a good one. Well, this afternoon, in addition to sitting in conversation with Dr. Matthew Sporza, moderated by a true and accomplished friend of Stadio, Mr. Kaya Sitole, 
It is also my singular honor to hand to Dr. Pauza the Fellow of Stadio Award. The Fellow of Stadio is the highest award and the highest honor that the Board of Stadio presents to persons who it believes have made a truly significant contribution in their discipline and area of engagement. The announcement of the award was made in April during the Stadio graduation ceremony. And I would now like to call on Dr. Simon Kekana, the head of our Centurion campus, to present the award to Dr. Porza. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Pauza, as a fellow lawyer, you will agree with me when I say that today there are too many of those terrible lawyer jokes doing their rounds. I mean, just the other day, my husband, who was also a lawyer, first thing in the morning said to me, what do you call 10,000 lawyers at the bottom of the ocean? A jolly good start. <laughs> Not funny. Don't laugh. <laughs> Dr. Pauza, you debunk every one of those terrible lawyer jokes. And it is, as always, my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the podium as you challenge us to think about speaking truth to power as part of constitutional duty. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. McKee. Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can hear me, those who are here, and those who are linked from wherever they are with us. And those who are not here, I want to give them the assurance that I will eat for them. <laughs> I will eat for them. <laughs> Professor Hussein, thank you very much to your colleagues for inviting me again to be a speaker at this very important platform. And I'm privileged to have my own colleague, Fire Stolle. And uh, Dr. Kekan. Most don't know we were at university together with Dr. Kekan. And those days we were different hairstyles. <laughs> but uh, that's like his life. I hope, Professor Sim, you will still like me after my speech. <laughs> but so be it. Let me preface what I am going to share with you today. That I'm a proud South African who believes that collectively across all boundaries you can conquer whatever comes our way. We we'll prove that repeatedly when we do things together, black and white, from all religions, from all cultures, we can conquer everything. As a proud South African and someone who respects the constitution of this country, I know that it is more than a document or a leather bound book on a bookshelf. It is a breathing, living document that guides the way we live and respect each other. It is a testament to the will of the negotiators who finished their work in 1996, if you like, the founding fathers and mothers. It is a timely reminder of what we can do when we have set our differences aside and look at the bigger picture to the challenge facing us as a nation. 
Why is the constitution clearly protects freedom of speech? There are growing noises <coughs> and actions that hint that we should be cautious when we speak truth to power. When we speak out against corruption, misuse of power, absence service delivery, discrimination, and insensitivity to the plight of the poor. Some so-called leaders are quick to call us counter-revolutionaries, clever whites or clever blacks, capitalists or protectors of minority interests. Our current government, in power for 28 years, has become hypersensitive to criticism. Any and all criticism is rejected whilst empty, speak repeated itself in public and private platform. What tends to be fashionable is populist language, which takes us nowhere. This, against the backdrop of being criminally weak on delivery, but very energetic on non coercive policy statements. Once we have this void of delivery and little policy certainty, we're faced with the corruption monster. As an ever hungry consumer of the hard earned taxpayer money, our justice system is slow and politicized, and our security agencies heavy on statements but light on action. There seem to be several people in leadership positions who are untouchable, even in the face of damning findings by the Zono Commission and the other commissions and agencies. Against this troubling optics of government living in the lap of luxury, whilst the electorate is facing power cuts, facing potholes, lack of water, checks for schools, and a strained health system, our government, the NC government, was severely punished at the municipal elections, losing control of prized metropolitan governments, and losing majority support in that sphere. I have very little doubt that this trend will continue in the 2024 elections. In politics, and I've been there for a long time, momentum comes. And the governing party is not the only loss in the trust of the voters, but also its position as the moral leader of society. We used to pride ourselves as members of the NC. We are the leaders of society. I don't think you can stand up again and say so. You're qualified to say so. And yet, some in government and the party seem to believe mistakenly that the party will govern forever. What is it? Government's job is not vague. It must improve the lives of all who live in our country, irrespective of race, or gender, or religion. The National Assembly must hold the government accountable to the last stand. And the judiciary must be left alone to do their job without fear or favor or prejudice. We are, however, currently in a situation where we confuse and conflate party and state. The government is increasingly usurping the powers of the other two pillars of good government. Our foundation is the Montesquieu Foundation of Separation of Power. Executive is executive. Judiciary is judiciary, legislative is legislative. We dare not play those lines, and we tend to do so at the peril of our democracy. The situation has now arisen sooner than we could have expected. A strong and principled leaders who are schooled in the ANC are looking elsewhere to find more suitable homes for their homes. <coughs> I see them in the municipal government in small little parties. And I said to myself, those are ANC brought up leaders who have rebelled against corruption, who have rebelled against failure, 
And then for the right in the democracy to take a stand. And we should support that right. Long time royalists have been remarkably given up hope that the party who liberated South Africa will reach deep within and renew itself. Renewal is cannot only be words, it's actions. Actions. And none of us should use ANC positions from our conferences as step ladders to government positions. I want to repeat this, because I think if that is going to happen, it is dangerous for democracy. But I will always be a suspect as I campaign in good faith that no, it's not me. He wants to be something else. Against this uncertain reality, we hear the distant rumblings of the formation of new political parties with its roots in the liberation politics. But its eyes on clean government, people are sensitive. People are sensitive, deliberate, and an avoidance of the current corrupt practices of those in power. Think of a moment what a effective government could have been done with the billions or so of land spent on the Zondo Commission, on the billions <coughs> see formed by the Guptas and others and their largely loving local associates. Think of a moment what our country could have done with functioning state owned enterprises. What could it have done with the billions which have been wasted in municipalities, never to be recovered? But nobody tells us where those billions in municipalities have gone to. But they're gone, we're told. Year after year, the old people are trying to the same story, but we don't hear the story of recovery. The rot is in. Think for a moment what could have been if we had woken up earlier to the complementary power of renewable energy. Fear of praise and public humiliation by those in power is not an option anymore. I'm saying fear cannot be an option. So when we speak out, we don't expect the security police to stand there and come and arrest us. We shall speak into their faces. We must point out the sickening and criminal abuse, misuse of our votes, trust, and money. The betrayals of our trust, aspirations, and values. We will refer to this in passing democracy, that there are leaders with no values. I listen to you. Those values are being betrayed every day. It's wrong. Silence will only serve to strengthen those who believe it is their best right to steal and plunder. When you keep quiet, the feeding on the peace continue to steal. Those fearless and honest leaders who must stand up and say, if I die, I die. But enough is enough. Are you and me sitting here? And you and me listening from wherever you are. We should say, enough is enough. If I die, let me die. It's not someone else. It's you actively listening to me, speaking to you. Our country is a strong one, but principled and brave young men and women of all races willing to lead together. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, I urge you not to sell your voices, not to sell your souls, as Mandela once said in the Bonnet Trials, not to sell your votes or your alliances cheaply. Treasure so your freedom, held by the Constitution, and protect your right to a better life and the right of the message to a better life. Served by, by an honest and competent government. And I want to say it's all in your hands. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kaya Tzole, and I have the privilege of posing a few questions um, to my guests, and hopefully I will not be beaten up at the end of the poll. 
Dr. Bosa, thank you very much for your for your words. And I suppose they come at a remarkably opportune time because we've seen in the past couple of years locally and across the world where facts have become negotiable and the very idea of what binds us together doesn't seem to exist anymore. South Africa unity, of course, keeps saying that we do have this one binding document. We do have this one binding social compact. And that, of course, is the constitution itself. It's over 25 years old now, and increasingly, the question of being asked about, wait, hold on, if this is to be the document that's ever the template for a better society, how are we, so many years down the line, not seeing anything close to a better society? I think I have answered you in advance that the constitution remains the cornerstone and foundation of our society. What is wrong is not the constitution, it's us. It's us who think it's our best rights not to respect human rights, not to protect the poor, not to protect the health of the sick, but to steal from them. And I'm choosing my words carefully. You saw during COVID when you stole from the sick. I'm not talking something, something abstract. It was horrifying to see millions of rents under P, 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 whatever they call them, and stealing from the sick and the dying. That's when we lost our moral compass. When we are put in government, the purpose of us being in government is to save. To serve the party, to serve the voters, not to serve ourselves. But we do it the contrary. <clears throat> and that contrary should accept punishment. And what is wrong with us? We announced from one commission to the other, one SIU to the other. And that announcement put very sensational front page of the newspaper. No action, no implementation of punishment. You can take whatever resolution you take in a commission, in an industrial summit, but if you have no problem of implementation, there will be no certificate about it. It can be sweet talk. And sweet talk, no one will eat sweet talk. It's that the politician is something, a and slogans. No one is so People eat puppet place, they eat bread. They want simple things, they want jobs, they want skills. That's why we, we lost it. And let me surprise you and say something here. When we came back from exile and we looked at the situation before moving the government, there are good things we did, but there are bad things we did. So you don't say I'm only on the best side of life. You know, when you close down a vocational training institution of nurses, which we did, when you close down vocational institutions in general, you lost the skills in the hands of the poor. You know, this teacher that like says they and this ones look at empowering people here. And they look ahead of their time because today no one will ask you at work how many degrees do you have? We ask you, what can you do? Simple. If you cannot answer the question, what can you do? I don't need you. You don't need me, doctor. I must be able to say, these are my skills. I'm a carpenter, I'm a plumber, I'm this. I can do something. You know, I'm a mechanic, I can do something. So we have left with masses of our people skillless. But the it, it, Constitution says something different. So the betrayal of the Constitution is on many fronts. But the, the most gruesome ones, when we are put in positions of power and we do wrong things. That's so that, that's across the wrong. So there's not a wrong with constitution. There's not something wrong with us. You, you mentioned the fact that the constitution on its own is the guiding light. And yet there seems to be a prevailing accountability vacuum in that when you mentioned all those instances of rebellion that are stolen when people are sick, when law enforcement doesn't seem to do much beyond the headlines. The question that then has to emerge is was the accountability compact the one part that we didn't master back then, which is why so many of these instances of corruption in our prisons still persist. 
And people know that after today's headline, there'll be another headline tomorrow. Somebody else is going to be trying to out still me tomorrow. So I want to deal with the papers today, tomorrow, somebody else. Yeah, I mean, it's the issue I'm talking about. The, I'm saying my paper, the, the legislature must hold executive accountable. I'm saying deliberately, but it's not only the executive, it's those who set the executive in administration. There must be consequences to crime. But we don't see, I mean, we hear a lot of these things, but we don't see accountability going to the extent of making people pay. The example of the municipality is a very living one, where billions are said to have disappeared and authorized expenditure. But where did they go to? They went into the pockets of people. No one is holding the council as accountable. And then they keep going back to council. And so, some of them, I was laughing this morning. Someone was saying another problems after a big election, they went to do a presentation. And when they got out, they said, please see so and so, one of my colleagues. I want to mention name, names. When they went to see him, he says, yeah, we had that you talk about this here in our province. This shall be our partners. Really? Is that how we do business? This thing happened in the past for eight hours. Is that how we do business? That's the battle of corruption at the seat of power. You know. So I can go on and on. And I'm not afraid. But when I was premier, I fired three MECs for the same reasons. And it didn't make me very popular, I must tell you, in my party. But I did not care. I did not care. I was actually hauled over the eyes, over the call, the, the, the call to say, how can you do this to your comrade? And that's where we lost it. So comrades entitled to steal, you're going to behave in a particular way. No. I never agreed from 1994, and I paid the price for that, and I'm proud that I paid the price. That's why I say, if you must die, you must die. When it's enough, it's enough. Dr. Kikana, the question of the education system is a remarkably important one. Dr. Fox's extension, um, we inherited a particular system, and there were some parts of the system that at least bridged the gap between access to higher education and access to skills. It was something that we then set up to dismantle for many reasons. And the problem, of course, is that it has intergenerational impacts. So now when we talk about the 10 or 11 million young people who are not in the primary education or training, it's simply because best intentions are understanding, you can't upload any of them into the existing infrastructure that we're without. Unfortunately, they're not going to disappear overnight. So what do we do? Uh, thank you uh, uh, for the question and uh, thank you for the input you have made, uh, Dr. Paul. Uh, the problems that we have in education stem from what Dr. Paul has already said. They come from the mismanagement of the implementation of the Constitution. The Constitution prescribes the manner in which this country needs to be governed, and you are not governing this country properly. When we took over in 1994, we dismantled the old apartheid system of a boundary education. Um, maybe uh, we were too hasty uh, because um, uh, some of uh, the offerings uh, of that particular time were clouded by the name boundary education. Because you can imagine what Mugabe did when he took over uh, in uh, Zimbabwe. He did not immediately say the British form of education uh, that was there must be done away with because it was colonial. He still maintained it. And today in South Africa, we envy the kind of teachers that have been produced by Zimbabwe. And in fact, basic primary education in Zimbabwe, the quality thereof is much better than what we have in uh, South Africa. So um, if we had not been too hasty, to bring down all the pillars of apartheid at that particular time. Definitely there were some that needed to be brought down immediately, race barriers, so on and so forth. But we should have taken time, particularly when we speak about uh, education, that we are careful about what we do. Because in replacing it, we did not replace public education with a quality, sustainable, and permanent system of education. We introduced outcomes-based education for which we did not provide a budget, for which uh, the educators in the educa uh, education sector were not trained, for which schools in our country did not have facilities, for which schools in our country did not have 
properly qualified teachers who understood the principles of outcomes-based education. And that is why it was so short lived. And because it, it was short lived, then our whole education system today is in tatters. There's a lot of confusion as far as our education system is concerned today. If you watch uh, the newspapers uh, last week, uh, the Department of Education has issued um, a, 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 a call for comments on the introduction of uh, children sangomas in our schools. Now you tell me, where are we going? Eh? We're going backwards as far as education is concerned. If we are going to the level that now, instead of improving the quality of education that we've got in our country, now we must begin to introduce uh, learners who are being trained uh, to become sangomas. In this post industrial revolution, when we should be worrying about introducing learning programs that will make us competitive, not only in Africa, but also throughout uh, Western, uh, uh, the whole world. Actually, a study was made uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, 2012 about um, the children who start schools in our country. Every year, about 1.2 million children, they start uh, their grade not or grade R uh, in a uh, basic education. But when they reach a uh, grade 12, they are no longer 1.2 million, but they are about 600,000. Half of them are gone, but nobody cares to know where that half has gone to. The Department of Education has never researched. This happens year in, year out. Of that 600,000 uh, student uh, learners who go through a uh, grade 12, only 350,000 of them are going to get a decent pass that will allow them to further their education. And of that 350,000, 100,000 of them are going to be allowed uh, to enter a uh, Western uh, University education. And of that 100,000, only 10,000 of them are going to graduate. 12 years plus four years, 16 years of wasteful expenditure as a result of the fact that we are failing to govern this country. And we fail to govern this country, not only in education, but in all spheres, as uh, Dr. Kosaj pointed out, in all spheres of life, we are failing to govern uh, this country. So what is the way forward? <laughs> Definitely the present crop of politicians that we've got in our country are not our solution. We've got to do something about that. You and I must stand up and begin to say there needs to be a change in the present crop of politicians that we have, in the present crop of political parties that we have. We need a new awakening. We need a new rebirth. And we shall not only improve education as an isolated um, uh, uh, offering in, in our country. We need a reformation throughout all aspects of the lives of the people uh, in the country. So we can only improve education. In the first place, we've got to improve how we govern this country. And criminals must go to jail. We must not have people who are protesting that some people must not go to jail when no. others are going to jail. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> I, I, if you allow me, Kai. You know, I had uh, many opportunities to sit down with the former President Mugabe, the lady who made so rest in peace. And I ask him, how did you get it right that you kept this high level of education? He was referring to that. Mm -hmm. Sitting like your father, eating pap and shima, I mean, sitting today, he says, you know what? You remember when we were in Mozambique? There was 93% literacy in 1974 when Prolimo took over. He says, I decided I would spend 40% of my budget on education. And that's what he did. So he added what he found. We were not to be bad, but we expect a miracle. This is of some moments. You cannot, in a scientific world with such technology, go into superstition instead of science. You're going the wrong way. You should move more towards science than superstition. Exactly. And I'm not running down anything, but that's not what I'm a cup of tea in that direction. The other issue, if I may mention this, is that. Um, we lack decisive, effective government. And I'm choosing my words carefully. In the history of governance, even if we study the paper, the, 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 the paper, American papers, founding fathers, the principle of decisive, executive decisions was underlined. And I'm very sorry, we don't have it in this country from top to bottom. We don't take decisions. 
And that's why we're wobbly and weak. We need to take decisions and implement those decisions. Why, where to go? I agree with you. Society is entitled to throw out those who don't work for them. Society is entitled to throw away the thieves. It's our democratic right to do so. I believe South African society is so strong and resilient. It will give birth to this new party that will lead it properly. I believe that. I can't say which one, but it will, it will happen. It's a dialectic of what people negate, they create something else. You can't deny this. It. It, there's no holy cow amongst political, political organizations. There are no holy cows. And if there's anybody who thinks of holy cows, right now, this, the polls, and I don't believe in polls so much, the polls put the NC below 50% in 2024. It's an, an unpalatable resource, but that's what it is. You know, so people are about to punish NC before. I would also put a proposition to both of you that South Africa probably has two forms of nostalgia and they need to deal with. The first one is what people refer to as apartheid nostalgia, where we say that that system worked well, when we say that the education system before 1994 was much better than what we have here. The problem, of course, is that apartheid was an illegitimate regime. So the proposition is that those that said that this meant everything were convinced that. The poisoned fruits of the tree associated with the illegitimate regime, regime must be removed. So when you now look back and then you say, hey, perhaps we should have been a bit more nuanced or a bit more selective, that causes anxiety for some people because for you and I, it may be we say the education system should have been preserved. Somebody also stop and say, Well, I'm a lawyer, the justice system should have been preserved because I think it worked better. So it gets us into very dangerous territory. So that's the first form of nostalgia that we deal with. The second one is the liberation party nostalgia where far too many people are still emboldened to the idea that they liberated us. So therefore, they must be the ones that we back at all costs, in spite of the overwhelming evidence that their capacity to govern is just not working out. What's your views? I, I think we must reject both nostalgia. Okay, exactly. Both of them. <clears throat> I, I will never stand here and say apartheid was good. It was never good. That's why I took up an AK-47 and fought it. But we say you don't throw away the the baby with the bath water. You look at what works <clears throat> and you say, how do I improve it? And what doesn't work, you throw it out. Okay. So take an example in Eastern Cape, people will tell you, you guys fought Matanzi, but he gave us fertilizers. He, he gave us plow shares to look at our land. And you NC came in, you don't give us fertilizers. Was there something wrong with Matanzi might did by giving the fertilizers? No, there was nothing wrong with that. Even if it was a party, it was right to give the people fertilizers. But they wanted to till the land and produce food. So I'm saying, and the, the, that's the first nostalgia. The second nostalgia I'm talking about, no liberation movement is entitled to rule forever. I'm saying it as a former commander of MK. No one, if Mandela said it, the people will deal with us like they dealt with apartheid if we behave the same way or even worse. Exactly. And I'm worried that as oppressed people, we should be more sensitive towards the majority, the masses. And that's what is missing, that is creating a rebellion in, in society. There's so much crime, you cannot explain where it comes from. And, but if you look at it in social economy, it might be. People are poor, unemployed, and all these things. You know, where do we go? I need to deal with that. We should not be afraid to say we need more vocational training in colleges. We should not be afraid to say so. Let's say what package of skills we want to deliver them. Can never be too late to educate anybody. As a young law student of the age of 20, 20 I had students in my class, you remember my name, he was 35 years old, studying the same degree with me, and he became a loyalist. It can never be too late to learn. So let's introduce vocational training institutions. I see solidarity is doing that, running ahead of all of us. Mm. They've done it and we can't deny it. So it's, 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 it's just it's only to deny that they've done it. They've done it. But we should do more of that and produce more skilled people. There's no shortcuts to, to skills creation. Mm. Uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Post on the issue of nostalgia. No, never. And the uh, apartheid was bad. It was evil. It cannot be countenanced. It must be done away with. But like he says, we should be selective in the things uh, that we find, and then we move on with those things. Remember what happened in 1924 in um, 
the Tsar of Russia was already dead after the Bolshevik Revolution. Lenin, uh, Trotsky, and the others introduced total communism in 1924 in uh, Russia. It did not work. The people hid what they produced away from the government because the government was communizing everything. They were taking everything. And the people in the cities, they were dying of hunger. Now, what did Lenin and Trotsky do? What they did was, no, we will have to water down our understanding of communism so that people can be able to accept it. In the same way, that happened, we've got lessons in history. But in this country, we don't learn anything uh, from history. So the present crop of politicians did not learn anything uh, from uh, history. Therefore, we cannot implement everything in terms of nostalgia. No, that is not acceptable. Yeah. Before you speak, Lenin said, we're talking from Lenin said, we as a revolutionary we must be very careful. We have a lot to learn from the previous administration. He was promoting the principle of mentorship. When we try to push this sort of mentorship in government, we're seen as supporting being reactionary. And therefore, the skill is left. The skill is left. So you have a world battle pusher today, being an, uh, able like an engineer and municipality. It doesn't work. So we, we chase away the skills. You must not be afraid that we did. But we introduced our own form of racism and discrimination. We did. And if we made those mistakes, we must correct it. I listened the other day to engineers volunteering today, because I think, to go and help Northwest to, to, to close portals. Bloomfontein called close portals. Engineers, where were they? They left. So they felt uncomfortable and said, I met the guy who designed my new plant in Australia and Perth. He said, Matthew, I had expectations of being ABC. When they were shut down, I left. And these people are all over the world. We should call back our uh, to guys in which we spend too much money and make be attractive again to them in my view. Dr. Bolson, you've come to us, you've said to us that we all <coughs> have a duty to speak truth to power and our country from duty. You said this was a big challenge. challenge. Rural calls up, runs that bank, he does it, and he gets burned. Paul Harris runs the bank, he finds it, he gets burned. Those years of Mandela village, he finds it, he gets burned, he gets fired overnight by President Tabo Baby. These are not insignificant individuals, these are individuals who spend and shout out them. So here we are sitting making weight in those who get burned overnight on the basis that they were trying to speak to power. Where on earth are we going to get that gravitas? Their legitimacy to even try. Because you give us challenge, I'm saying to you, if those people couldn't pull it off, I'm struggling to see how I can cost me some. I speak the way I speak because we're trying to create a platform to counter that. Because we don't speak like this. We won't protect the good men and women in the public service. Okay. I'll refer to an example of a man who I saw growing up. I took him from the taxi, Jagumabus. May you saw rest in this. I made him a chairman of Mumala Atiromo Corporation. It's premium. Because after that's get business skills in this thing. You know, the next thing, Jamu is known by everybody. And uh, in a different way, not far away from Texas, but from business, in a different way. And then he comes to me and says, Brother, I'm being asked to be the CEO of SO. I said, Do you want to ban yourself to use your way? I said, Do you want to ban yourself? And when they ban, when he ban himself, he says to me, so rest in peace. Yeah, you told me. And that's what we're talking about. So, so I agree with you, but we must protect the good men and women in the public service. Yeah. And just to add on what Dr. Posa says, the problem in our country is that after 1994, there were some people, particularly from the African National Congress, who privatized liberation. You see, they said liberation was brought to South Africa by the ANC, and no other person can deal with liberation in this country. Good people, yes, they made a very serious contribution, but it does not mean that those who were in the country did not contribute to the barrier. And that is the biggest mistake at that moment. I personally made that mistake as well. I was in Mamelodi when we hosted um, 
uh, 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 written is, as, 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 as they call them. And I was uh, uh, chairing uh, that meeting and I said, uh, the people who will take positions uh, in this country are uh, these people. That was the biggest mistake of my life. Little did I know that this country was going uh, to go to wrong. So they privatized mm, and they arrogantly mm, put themselves as the only liberators in uh, our country. We are all our own liberators and we all participated in uh, liberation. Therefore, it is, becomes our responsibility to take up the cudgels now, to take up the spear now, because the spear has fallen. All of us must take up the spear and change what is happening in this country. Thank you. Dr. Bosa, you say we must protect those brave enough to put up their hand and say, I want to serve the public, I want to serve the state. And that would be easy to digest if those instances of people being, you know, hounded on the job, for example, were accidental. We now know from the State Capture Commission that these things were not accidental. These things were planned. These things were executed with the ultimate intention of hounding out those that had an interest in order for the state, in order to replace them with those that wanted to steal from the state. That is what we now know. What we also unfortunately know is that the political party with which you are associated must find that process. So they came to us and then they said, We've delivered this liberation. We are now going to deliver a better society for all. Most commonly, that the ACS has since 1994. And yet, it is still a party whose fabric, whose architecture allows so many of the kleptocrats to run it and dominate it. I'm questioning the very legitimacy of what the ACS is essentially saying. Well, I agree with you, unfortunately. My whole speech said so, in so many ways that we have betrayed the values or betrayed the trust. What I fought for and sacrificed my youth for, I don't I feel betrayed. Do you know what I'm saying? I wonder whether it was worth it. But something says it was worth it. Because the future cannot be determined by a few thieves and a few corrupt people. We must fight back in civil society. And it's, and it's good universities and uh, institutions like this one provoke thought so that from thought to this action, we must agitate against what we see. The NC will not survive the wrath of the people because of what you said. It's not going to survive. We've seen it all over in Nicaragua. The Sandalisa were flushed out. They lost power. They came back with their tails between the legs, banging the people to vote for them, and they behaved better. The NC. We need a radical, we can talk about radical, a radical reviewer. Whether or not it will happen within the ANC as it stands now, I'm very doubtful. There may be a rupture, which may be a healthy thing for the ANC. It may be a rupture to get the best out of it, to stand somewhere and lead. Our society is made up of very good people from all walks of life. These people need to come together under a flag of clean government. If you read my speech carefully, I'm saying so, in as careful as I can. We, we need a platform where people can unite who believe in clean government. And the ANC, unless it has a rupture, it will not qualify to be that platform. The people reject it and to lose power. I mean, Fredimo is suffocating. Zano is suffocating. They have to use very, very sharp practices to stay in power. Is that what it is? We should end power because people trust you. Right now, the NC will lose power because people don't trust the NC. Maybe it's healthy. Is there any legitimacy to the proposition that we just don't have any viable alternative, unfortunately, at the stage? No, it's not true. It's not very true. I think time will prove me right. There, there will be Bible opposition. And there will be an alignment of forces in after 2024, which might even form a government. And then the ANC joins them. Unless the ANC joins that alliance of forces, it will be an opposition. And I'm not saying something funny. What has happened to Ekuru Lenin? The ANC is an opposition. Do I understand? The NC is in opposition. Nelson Mandela, the NC is in opposition. So in power, 
They did go to Pretoria. The exit is opposition. That, that development could reflect itself on the national platform very easily. And it's looming large to be the issue like this. It, it's, it's not good comfort to deny the reality that's building. The ANC could be in opposition, not only, it's in opposition in Western Cape. It was in opposition in KZN in 1994. And IFP is very confident. They said yesterday they didn't put a mayor, a premier candidate because they know they'll take over. It's not idle talk. The ground shows that it is shifting. So the shift of the ground nationally will force the ANC into coalitions or into opposition. Simon, you live in a country where in a matter of days, over 300 black people could be killed on the basis of a dysfunctional political conversation. Over 300 people died, and within weeks, we've moved on. That's the country that you live in now. Where did it get there? We got there uh, through a number of factors. It is not only one factor. But all these number of factors can be encapsulated in one way, <clears throat> can be encapsulated in lack of governance, and it can be encapsulated in, as the good doctor here has pointed out, the lack of proper implementation of the constitution. And also, the present a crop of political parties, and particularly the governing party, appropriating to itself the resources that are available in order to bring order in the lives of the people, to train policemen properly, to house people properly, to educate people properly. All those resources were taken away from people. Now, today, we lack resources to even appoint sufficient policemen to bring about order in our country sufficient judges, sufficient teachers to teach our children, sufficient schools where our children can be housed. Now we've exhausted all these funds, not through proper implementation of programs, but through corruption. As we speak now, there is no money. The good doctor has pointed out here that in 2020, when we had Corona, PPEs were a very big source of corruption in our country. Millions and indeed billions have been siphoned out of this country. And you and I are going to die in the process as a result of the fact that there is no money to provide services to people. Now, um, what is going to happen to us then in the end? But I think that question has already been answered. There is going to be creativity among the people of South Africa. They will come out with a solution. There will be a rebirth. There will be a new political party that will try to bring about order uh, in uh, the country. And changes will definitely uh, begin uh, to take place uh, in our country. Yes, we are going through a very rough patch, a terrible patch in our lives. But um, uh, the dawn of a new day is coming in our country. Let me tell you something. Else. So, if you look at the NC now, it's like a, a bleeding animal walking. Doesn't matter whether the Mapas are criticizing them or not, the hemorrhoids will not stop. As long as it is stuck at this way, the bleeding will continue. And if an animal bleeds and continues to bleed, it will fall down. I'd like to take questions from the floor. We've got a few questions from YouTube, but I'd like to hear from the people within the room. I don't know if we can have the mic moving around. One hand there, um, two and three. <coughs> Unless you believe that your voice is powerful enough to project. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, very interesting discussion, and uh, I come from one of, I'm one of the people who came back, and an African woman, so I'm a bit of a strange white man sitting here. 20 years ago, I worked in Botswana at a school called the Swanangu School. 
Bournemouth State Schools in Botswana had a poster in the headmaster's office which defined corruption as a type of lung disease that cattle have and they, they should be killed. That was their basic uh, breakdown of corruption. Um, and I've always wondered when we listen to the radio, we're constantly hearing about corruption, 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 but is there a word in your native language which is equivalent to corruption? Or do you constantly have to reinterpret it to explain to people? Because in English, I grew up speaking English, it's the only word I know which means corruption. So are there other words which are better, which are more forceful that we should be using, or should we be defining corruption better in society? All right, thank you. There was a second hand, yeah, in the third one there. Yeah, third row. Yeah. You suggested that the constitution is one document and we are we are implementing it successfully. I just question as to whether um well the yeah, is magnificent, whether certain structures created by the constitution it's very, very difficult. That made it very difficult to govern the country properly and will continue to make it difficult to govern the country properly based on the constitution as opposed to individual people, moral standing and intellectual standing. We have uh, we have three tiers, three levels of governing, only the, the, the national, provincial, and then the local, with only the local having any power to have any responsibility to the people who voted them in. Beyond that, there's nobody you can talk to. You might be able to talk to your local councillor and threaten him that he can't fix whatever it is you asked him and to fix. He probably won't have a job next year, whenever the election is, but it doesn't work above that, which means that everybody at the provincial and the national level has no responsibility or accountability to the people who put them in power. And that change could make a difference, I thought. All right, you. Any other hands on the door? Yeah. Second yeah. row, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I heard Dr. Cause, Dr. Cause talking about the speaking out, you know, the importance of speaking out. So I want to, actually, I want to talk about gender-based violence and the importance of the correctness of the messages that people as they try to speak out uh, end up saying. So I want to give you an example of a, I actually had that when I was driving here and I you know, was um, fortunate to compose myself because this political leader was talking about gender-based violence saying that and um, he has experienced it because his aunt was raped uh, and uh, killed. But what shocked me was the fact that he then says that uh, what kind of government do we have? And I just feel that uh, messages such as those should not be linked to the problem that we are having of gender-based violence in our country. You know, the problem we are, if, if our leaders stand up against issues of crime, issues of gender-based violence, they should not use the platform for their own political remedy. You know, so I just wanted to hear what's your comment on that because I, I just felt like you know people don't know the difference in when to speak against the wrongs of the of the of the government and of the leaders and so on but also when it's time to focus on issues related to um, the experiences of women in this country. All right, thank you. I want to start with the constitutional point, but I'm a constitutional lawyer. The, 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 we had that debate um, for a long time, really following all the constitution. And what delayed Kodesa was that debate of centralization and decentralization. 
So young people come in and thought it was very nice. We we'll call them in with our power. <laughs> Welcome. Each generation has got the right to extend the frontiers of the constitution. You cannot say in the meeting, what was good in 1994 is good for the chancellors. They might run something else. And as long as they follow their own constitutional process, process of amending the constitution, they're entitled to do. To solve their, the problems of their day. Constitution is a living organ, organism. You shouldn't change it rightly or easily, but you should have the right to responsibly handle it. If you ask me, I don't think we need nine policies to say there are too many, too many blue lines. I don't think we need nine provinces. Maybe we need four or five. And I don't think we need tribalized provinces. Sorry for me, my whole life I've called tribalism. Our provinces are tribalized. Eastern Cape is too Tosa. Northwest is too Joanna. Kenan is too Zulu. The Pope is a concoction of three. Now, we need, you know what we say? We are afraid to tell the truth that we have tribalized, we have fought Pakistan, but we have tribalized provinces. We should cut the nonsense and reduce them. We must be South African of all races, of all tribes, of all ethnic groups. Mm. That's a point of fighting for the constitution for me. We should not mess little tribal sentiments. That's why. Two, the issue of how many municipal government you need to have, it's a big issue for me. You need to reduce them. Need, that's why you need to centralize more. But what are you doing? You have a municipality to not take space. What type of municipality is that which can provide water and sanitation? But it's a government. So you should say, make a proper assessment of this municipality. It's a what do you need, what don't you need? What you don't need, please get rid of and try and elevate the centralization of people where the combination of the poor and the rich can find the need. Where you find the need, then that's why we have a profit of local government. Proper accountability will follow. If you reduce these provinces, there will be more accountability. Right now, the government is too far with blue lights. You can see them, but they are not next to you. The size of the national parliament is too big. Why do you need two seats of government, Cape Town and Pretoria, houses of ministers, Cape Town and Pretoria? Who's paying for that? Is it not time to decide that for only one house? Somewhere. We need to question, interrogate our structures. They know what the cows in constitution making. So it's a bigger question to ask, but you can see how I'm going around it. I've thought through it before. Some argument we lost, some wanted nine progress, others wanted five, but we lost argument with nine. Very tribal in character. We should be looking at those things again. And then the issue of gender based violence. I don't understand why this is not such a difficult issue to understand for anyone in this country. We face with a constitutional promote quality of human beings, of sexes, that we all be equal. Away even from the violence, when we see each other in the, in the employment space, just there in our own homes. The, those equality must start there. How we bring up the boy child and the girl child? The education we give to them or promote equality in a way of looking at one another, you know. And how you bring up a girl child, you know, in your society, you don't want them to be educated. No, you can't. It's not right. They must be educated, they must be economically independent. When you come to the violence which you unleash against one another, for me, it's the red line. The red line. You can blame the government for the sun and the winter, but you must take responsibility as citizens that in our interaction, how do we behave towards one another? But we cannot give a blind eye to the violent being against women. It's an issue. 
whether it's in the form of a rape or other emotional abuse or physical abuse. It's there in our society. We cannot give it a blind eye and, and say, when I have assaulted my wife to blame the government. That's not right. You must blame me and I must carry the consequences. I think that's your point. It's not the government, it's me. I've assaulted my wife. I've assaulted um, my, the professor said, I don't have the right to do all those things. So that's how we should look at it. Must take responsibility for one another. Now, how do we define for our I don't know if I can answer it, but my own hands tell to me, and I try to break it down in my speech. Some people think they have the right to steal. Because stealing is for them. The Bible says, Thou shalt not steal. It's steal. If you talk those specific things, but for me, also, it's an issue of governance. What is right must be done right. You understand? In which the ethics, how we behave, and how we should not behave, you understand, in, in, in between ourselves. You know, when you steal, I don't know, you steal, it's corruption. When you are deceitful, it's corruption. I mean, it's, you can break it into pieces. We don't have one suit to wear for it. I don't know about cloth or blue. I don't have it, but I know what it is. I know that it's a game, but it's not a donkey when I see it. Yes, it will be a, a difficult to come up with a, a situation. I think maybe for the Batwana out there, uh, it was easier because you've got more cattle than you've got people in the Batwana. And therefore, <laughs> maybe that's very hard to make it easier. But I don't think give myself a one day I'm going to go uh, to respond to you. But to go back to that constitutional uh, question again, I'm not a constitutional expert. But I think maybe it's high time that we move away from voting for a political party in our country, and that we start to vote for people who will represent us in parliament, and therefore we can hold them accountable. Maybe we need to do that. We've got a couple of questions from the online platform, and the first one, sure, tricky one. The implementation of uh, BDE has not yielded desirable results. What needs to be done to empower Black people, Africans in particular, in various business sectors? Kekal is an expert on BE. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving out to be an expert on everything. <laughs> um, you know, um, we must understand how a BEE came about. It is a constitution, constitutional uh, matter that we have a BEE today. If you go and check section 217 of uh, the constitution, that uh, in order to create a level playing field uh, in our country, in terms of the resources that are available to everybody in the country, it is necessary to introduce a BEE. Before 1994, tenders were only known uh, to white people. We black people did not know about uh, tenders. Now, after 1994, uh, tenders uh, became even much more uh, 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 was in uh, many uh, uh, in uh, our country. But we had also to benefit uh, from uh, those tenders. We didn't know much uh, about them. Now, this was money. This is uh, tenders are money that you and I pay in the form of taxes. And we cannot have one group of people benefiting uh, from that kind of money. And that is why then it will in section 207, then it says, um, in disbursing tenders in our country, government must ensure that particularly the previously disadvantaged uh, people must be uh, considered as far as tenders are concerned. Unfortunately, a lot of corruption then came out in uh, the form of uh, tenders. Uh, people became friends uh, for companies uh, that were more experienced without uh, being given the skills uh, that they need in order to be able to stand on uh, their own. And then um, uh, politicians themselves uh, following uh, what is written in section 217 of the constitution, then they gave tenders to their friends who mismanaged uh, the funds and then there was no uh, was in, uh, uh, service delivery. But the spirit, the spirit, the idea that everybody in the country must benefit uh, from tenders, it was a good one. Unfortunately, in implementation, uh, we failed. 
And that is why about a month back, a government said we're introducing a new BEE law to ensure that the um, uh, tenders are now put on a, a different uh, footing. So in principle, there is nothing wrong with uh, the BEE law. The problem is the implementation. It goes uh, to cadres, uh, it goes to relatives, uh, and you've seen it uh, in uh, the newspapers uh, that relatives are getting this. There's a lot of corruption as far as that is concerned, and government is not policing it properly, and that is why there is a problem with a BDD in our country. I told you, you know, see. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, fair, let me be fair, I'm in, I'm in private sector. The, the, there's a lot of abuse of the BE policy in private sector. There are many of our black people who are going to the France because they buy a Mercedes Benz, they give them a nice house. They say he holds shares 25%, but it's a debt which you can never pay. That's why there's no more frontline stories about this BE that BE. What happened to them? They were find that I want there are never genuine schemes. So many black executives are allowed themselves to be used in the private sector as friends, you know, because you got a good salary, a good, a good uh, Mercedes Benz, even bodyguards. But to collude to a fraudulent scheme in a big corporate, Kaya, you know that. You know I'm telling the truth. I'm not talking about tenders and I'm talking about private sector. There's been abuse of the empowerment of, of, of Africans in, in, in the private sector. But you right, government policy has been abused. But if it has been abused, we must find a solution. We must find a solution. The solution cannot be continued with it as it is. We will continue to abuse it. And I've said this, and people are angry with me, and I'll say it today, because I don't mind who being angry with me. And I'll tell you where I learned that from, from my father. An inspector of school, we know they used to tell us principals. Mm. Said to you, Mr. Boss, I will about something. I'm very angry with you. So you're not the first one to be angry with me. So I'm not worried about you angry with me. I think we must review the PE law. Must review it. I don't say I can't say how it should be structured, but the way taking into account the abuses, we must review it. And so how can we draft that law in a way that cannot be abused or we can intercept the abuse? Because as it is now, I don't care whether it's public sector or private sector, it is being abused or in both areas of, of life. You will see I am almost short of saying you must get rid of it <laughs> and put something different. Very, very difficult proposition, uh, particularly in light of the fact that the economy still remains so entrenched in the hands of the people. I suppose there's a caveat when you say BE hasn't worked. BE has worked very, very well for some members of the NC. Of course, of course. Different than being a good example of that. So of course, of course. It is difficult to imagine that oh, a person that keeps advocating BE to be killed because it literally made a billionaire overnight. I don't know if it's a billionaire. What it depends on the farm in Parapala. I don't think that's in there. I doubt it. If you're right, then it has enriched that that's part of the problem. There are those that enriched. And most of them are those who are great to be hired soldiers for capital mm. and not promoting in their own space mm. proper BE. No, no, no. You can start from a male deal mm. where the president was involved. In yeah. Yeah. Mm. It made them rich, Indeed. but it didn't make anyone in the world fall to rich. Mm. And I'm sorry, it's not here to respond to what I'm saying. Mm. I prefer to engage you within a friend. Mm. But it's a, it's a good special example of a BE, yes, which yes. we know. Yes. But we need to review the BE law. That's my, my bottom line. And say, what's wrong? We can't say it's holy cow. We're, we're on what basis? No, no. There's so many wrong things. Mm. Um, just a last addition. Uh, I always argue in uh, the classes that I have that I want to be shown a poor person who come from the villages who became rich as a result of BE. I've not yet met him up to today. The only people that I meet are people who were in prominent political parties, like the, the like the men from the Parapalagin Reserve, <laughs> like <laughs> you are Tokyo Cephalis. Huh? Those are the people that became rich as a result of BEE. But you can think about it from the villages where you come. 
or from the townships where you come from. Show me one person who became rich as a result of a DEA. And then maybe we can say, yeah, yeah let's but, consider but, but Kekan, yeah. you know, and Wakai, you know, <laughs> the old guys like Maponya and others did not need be to be No, he didn't become a No, there was no BE. No, there was no BE. No, there was no BE. They were entrepreneurs. They exactly. made themselves from strength. Exactly. We must not, not look for this cheap mercy of being Lord. You know, must give people skills to be able to create jobs and, exactly. and then to become entrepreneurs. Exactly. I think we shouldn't avoid the issue. The Mamboya didn't need anybody's mercy. I mean, I've been in many parts with him before he died. May he so rest in peace. Mutonya did not need all those. And there are many such old people. You know them in, 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 in Nashville. They never needed to be him, but they were very successful. Why can't we do what they did? And just as an aside, and you mustn't think that we are talking badly about the man from Palapa. He was our junior at university. He was behind us, so we knew him very well. The last point I'd like to bring to you is at the end of the day, we are a constitutional democracy in the country. And of course, democracy is the one thing that universally people say it's the way to go. And yet, it is the same system that has in recent years delivered to Donald Trump. It is the same system that in recent years has delivered Boris Johnson. And in fact, even perversely, those being some of the oldest democracies, you can see how broken the system is in that Boris Johnson has had a firm party that is of people. So then he's on camera and said, you don't want me anymore. And then there are there a few hundred members of British society getting to decide who the next prime minister is. After nobody else can participate in the process, it is a remarkably broken system. So there's a couple of questions that have been asked here to say, is democracy the proper political system for the issues that we're trying to resolve? Because at the end of the day, it is democracy that will deliver one day, maybe, to us, your friend from that province, the cat, it will be democracy. Yes. If you end up winning this president, my name will be the name yes. and it was democracy that delivered Kuba in 2007. Yes. And yeah, yeah. what happened there after? Yeah. What do we do about that question? I'm not sure if Democrats have delivered Hitler. No. <laughs> no. You see, no. It's, it's an old debate about systems. Mm. But the, the tried and tested system is being the one by Democritus. Mm. It, 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 again, we go back, it's, it's human beings. Mm. What made Boris go and hold the party when the Queen was in mourning? was because he's a naughty boy. <laughs> It's a naughty boy. It's not okay. the, the British, British system does not have constitution, the conventions. But those conventions have been are timeless. They hold. That's why when they bring you down, they bring you down very quickly. But it goes to conventions guide them on how they should behave. You don't need a document like we have. Mm. If you have established uh, co 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 self codified conventions, mm. they were. Now, it, so it's human beings holding a party while it's the queen is in mourning. So, in our situation, as human beings who are stealing money from the sick, stealing from people, is a system. It's human behavior, again, even if when you put a, a document that have been placed in this whole money. So it's human behavior or misbehavior that causes problems. Exactly. We can't avoid that. So we must go back to say there must be consequences, there must be accountability, exactly. there must be consequences from wrong behavior. Exactly. And punish people. But in this country, no one gets punished. No, no, nobody. Uh, give me one who was punished in the past uh, 12 months. No, mm. good. One, give me one name. Who is in jail? You know, I'd like to count them. There won't be two. Mm. Amen. Um, a very interesting question, and I agree with uh, the input there uh, by uh, Dr. Posa. Uh, uh, but I'm also inclined to think that democracy is still the best system that you can ever hope for. You know, in 2010, when we had the World Soccer, you remember it also? Yeah. Um, some um, market uh, surveyors, they went to South Korea. Remember South Korea had the, had the World Soccer together with Japan uh, just before us, not so. So they went back to Korea to go and ask the people in South Korea. But what do you think about the fact that in African country, was able to host the world soccer successfully. And the South Koreans in one way said, we are shocked, we are surprised that they could do it. We never expected that they would do it. 
And then uh, the question, the second question came. Now, what do you expect them to do now going forward? And they made five conditions for us as South Africa. They said, you know, if South Africa wants to move now away successfully from a successful hosting of uh, the World Soccer, the first thing that they need to do is to take education seriously. Now, the government is not taking education seriously. If you look at basic education, it's not been taken seriously in our country. How can we help because it's not that uh, children putting their uniform in a, a, name, a container in order to cross a river to go to school? How do you explain that one? It tells you that this government is not taking education seriously. But they said, if they can take education seriously and all of them they participate in the fourth industrial revolution, that is the kind of education that they must have, then South Africa will be able to move forward. The second thing that they need to do is they must look at the economy. Once they get education, then they must address the economy. Then everybody will be able to get jobs in our country. Is that what we are doing? That is not what we are doing in this country. But if you can do that, then we can satisfy the second step. Then they said, the third step that they must go to, they must work hard. We're not hard workers in South Africa. In South Africa, no, we're not hard workers. We can sit in our townships with papers strewn all over the streets. Nobody will organize a legitimate to say, let's work hard to keep our township clean. Nobody will be able, will be able will do that. They must work hard. We don't work hard in this country. Idea number four, they said, then because they will not be able to do these three, three things willingly, they must go and get a dictator who will force education down their throats, who will force them to go and work, who will force them uh, to improve the economy of the country. If they can do that for five years, then they will get used to the idea of working. Then they will get used to the idea of going to school and getting an education. After five years, they must give that dictator another five years <laughs> so that it must be entrenched in their minds. Uh, you know, uh, the, the Koreans, that is what they went through uh, in uh, their history, if you read uh, Washington, uh, uh, their history. Now, unfortunately, in South Africa, we'll never get a good dictator. The man from Uganda was something else. Now, the man from Palapala, our friend, is not playing ball. I had hoped that maybe he would do something because, you know, he's our friend. We were with him at school. But I'm, I'm sorry, we're not following that script from South yeah. Korea. <laughs> Let's not teach young people wrong things. We don't want dictators. <laughs> we said certain things before, most of the When you leave here to go out, we will ask you, what can you do? I want to repeat this because the question is, what skills do you have? So you must make sure. While we have an opportunity, while their parents can still afford it to acquire skills, well, that's all we need out there. You can have your gown, as a degree, but we're not going to ask you about the color of your gown. We won't, we're not interested. We're going to ask you, what can you do? And institutions such as this one answer that question. They give us skills. And we talked about the need for vocational training that there should be much room in for vocational training institutions. And then young people must embrace those institutions and go and get the skills. It can be a carpenter, a plumber, a mechanic, an actuary, an engineer, whatever field of engineering, but be able to do something for humanity. I just want to repeat some of those things, but they were not here. Yeah. The last point, um, something that almost done in each time a few years ago. We now all acknowledge that our education system in particular is just not where it ought to be. And part of the problem is that whether it's 1994, 1997, OBE, and all these other structures, everybody who comes into the system wants to live their own personal legacy. So we shift from one system to the other, not because of the better outcomes that you anticipate, but because, well, I'm here now, I must do it on my turn, I must do it my way. Senator Reyes. My view a few years ago is that given the importance of education to get in this country to survive for a few generations, do we not then consider having that one element of our society, the education system, 
accountable to society itself. In the sense that you look at chapter nine institutions, mm -hmm. where if I go in as an auditor general, the constitution guarantees me a breach of tenure mm -hmm. because they know very well that in the absence of that, they'll find me as soon as I tell them that that is dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. For a long time, we had what we thought was a good public protector model. I thought they see these mm -hmm. days, uh, we've got pushed around that. Mm -hmm. But in instances like that, where the accountability is to society primarily rather than a political principle. Does that not give us a better chance of having an education system that is responsive to the needs of the country rather than the wins or whoever wins the lottery of being the next cabinet minister in charge of our education system? What is the question about tenure? Let's have our education system structured differently. Let's not have a report to a minister. Let's have a report directly to parliament. Let's have the ability to hold the Ministry of Education more accountable rather than hope that the current incumbents, whether it's Mr. Zimande or whether it's Mr. Sojeta, decide to listen because that's something that's in. You are more in education. <laughs> your field. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, question, and uh, um, it's a very uh, tricky uh, question. Uh, I suppose that in that uh, situation, then we'll have to send something like a chapter nine uh, institution uh, for education. I hope you understand uh, what the question says, that you must have a chapter nine, uh, what's name, a body uh, specifically uh, for uh, education. But I think in the present system, we've got enough participation by parents uh, to demand that education must be managed uh, differently. The only drawback is that most of the parents that we've got participating, for example, in SGBs, are not parents who have been uh, to school and have got degrees. They are parents in most cases who are even being controlled by the principal, who are being told by the principal what must happen. So I think the present model that we've got in our country is democratic enough is participatory uh, enough. Uh, it gives us more voice in what is happening uh, in uh, the schools, and uh, we can hold uh, people uh, accountable. Unfortunately, the committees do not have people who understand what is happening in education. That is what I would say. I'll say, Michael, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. Children in South Africa still die in these toilets on the basis that yeah. the government hasn't got that right. That should be a terrible impact with all of us. Quite interestingly, when I engage with the Minister of Basic Education to say, why have you not still fixed this? One of the issues that emerges is to say, well, you can tell me that there has to be a school in that particular neighborhood. My competency is the schools, but the sanitation, the water, the electrification is somebody else's competency. So how do we actually then do that? Because yeah. everybody says that somebody else is responsible for that thing, mm -hmm. and then eventually not responsible for anything. No, there is a coordination of functions. That's what the answer is. It lies in coordination of functions. Take a premium. Function of a, of a premium coordinate functions. If you plan a school, you have a very terrible experience in this country where houses are in the bush. RDB, RDB, RDB houses in the bush. Mm -hmm. with no school, with no crash. But these houses are there. Where the children are supposed to go? Who live in those houses? Mm. But then within those departments, they must stop being silos. They must work together. If you build or prepare a school, public works must be part of that. And then they must be compliant with all other laws, whether they are health or what, they must be full compliance with all other laws as you build like just such. There's no department to stand on its own. Every, all these people must talk to one another. You know, if you must, I mean, if you take now, they've got the minerals and energy and all the environmental and all those things. I'll give you a simple example. If they don't coordinate that in an arc way, the one department will hold that whole economic development. Because you, they're not coordinated. Same thing with education. You must say, what must it coordinate with? But if you come back to, say, tertiary education, there is governance in the governing uh, structures. Me and Professor Singh have been to one institution where the governance had collapsed. And we had a commission of inquiry which we, we conducted. Good example. And there were quite a number of them all over because governance has collapsed. 
So, the services were poor. In some situations, the director was giving the tender for the computer to his wife. And the, he's laughing. But it's true what I'm saying. But uh, so it's governance and collapse. The service to the community is lost, you know. So, so I think we should not run away from wrong governance structures. We need proper governance structures. Yes. Now and then, I'm sorry, we need a lot of about you, Lisa, which I was not there when I was there. I don't like your service. Mm. I'm sorry. Yeah. But it is shown to when governance gets weak, what can happen. Mm. So we need to strengthen our governance structures in institutions, whether it's university or school, so things are run properly. Government and planning infrastructure must be coordinated. The coordinated, it's not just me, I'm going to build. It is a lot of things. We must provide water. You know, I have to provide water to the school in form. I have to swing a form home. The school is beautiful. It's named after me. I was very ashamed. How can they name this school after me when the trials can flash? So I had to spoil a ball home. Now the school has got water. But someone should have thought about water. I'm giving a perfect example, you know. And go on. Yeah. Right. But thank you for your questions. Very, very important deliberations. And would you think we are out of time? Oh, there's some questions on the floor. Take one last round. So one hand here in the front. Uh, let me start by making a contribution to uh, what is wrong. Oh, corruption in Sibiria and Zitzona. We call it my for no. So you can hear by the sound of the way that is concocted. So I have two questions. The, the first one, uh, when I observed how the events have uh, unfolded uh, regarding the issue of corruption and speaking power, truth to, to power, it seems like some, I repeat again, some of our leaders, it seems like they set alarm to speak truth. When they are not in government, it seems like they know the truth. But when they get in, then the truth rises. When they go out again, then they speak the truth. So I just want to understand if there is something uh, wrong happening inside that forbids them to speak the truth. Besides an addiction to pill charts. No, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, as a former, uh, I'm not sure if you are still uh, connected to the ANC, Dr. Uh, Bossa. 100% connected. All right. And the right to criticize it. Okay. So <laughs> now the ANC, they are now within the narrative of redeeming itself. So I want to understand, uh, is it possible for ANC to renew itself if the ANC is still having uh, all the material within it? For example, having a Minister of uh, Basic Education who has been in that position for 18 years. Thank you. They're still asking. Oh, they're asking other questions. Yeah, no, but you were going to respond. Um, so my question is just, uh, I'd like to know that in terms of this, what is the role of government when it comes to holding its people accountable? And by its people, I mean the people who are actually in power. Because um, just to add on to what Sula just said, um, there's some ministers who've been in power for over 10 years. How is it they, that they always avoid cabinet shuffles and I feel like it's just come to a point that there's no consequences for the people who are in government, but then again, there's also nobody else to vote for because then the other option that it seems like they have to vote for, the other parties, it seems like they are just full of anarchy and then the other, the other parties just seem like we're gonna go back to our old system that we just recently got out of. And I feel like as though that is the reason for a, a brain drainage in the, South, in the South African country. And then the government itself comes back and complains that there's a shortage of skills, but there's no competency from government itself. And I feel like that's a, that's why a lot of 
young people as well to not vote because we are not heard at all. So I so we know we know that um you guys said something about skills and i do understand that yes we do get skills from yes we do get <laughs> yes we do get <laughs> what's going on then Um, yes, we could get skills from our tissue as we have practical things, but then we live in a world with, whereby, we, whereby we know that um, they say connection and connection is the way forward. So if we don't have connection, then what must happen to us? What must happen to the rest of the kids that don't, that, that don't have connections? Because it's like we are disadvantaged now. So. That's what I want to know. What's going to happen to the unemployment rate? Is it going to go down further, or is the government going to do something about it? Right. So the first one was so the, the first one is uh, you must remind me if I forget. You see, over two different high stars. The the you know I tell you in a way of a joke. The joke which I hate. Someone asked an African leader the same question. Why do you criticize the government when you're outside? When you are inside, you keep quiet. It says in Africa, we don't talk when we eat. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, I, I hope you listen to my speech. I've always been frontal as a politician. And I've said to you, it didn't make me popular, but I don't care. I fired three MECs who were my comrades because I didn't want to be populist at the cost, the expense of the taxpayer. I don't want to name them, they know themselves. So there are those who behave exactly the way you say, you don't want to speak when you are eating. And the, those who stood up and took a stand against corruption. And I'm one of them, you need from my say. It's not a secret. That's why I mean, I'm very comfortable to speak. They to be reported They're in social media that attack me. I don't respond to nonsense, I ignore them. Okay. The truth will come change because someone calls you names, you understand. And what else your second question is about the renewal. No. Again, I made the point. There needs to be a rapture. A renewal of the concoction we have is not going to happen. That's why the president is trying to step aside and all that. It's like fighting fires. They need to be a rapture in the NC for it to renew itself. The NC must be reborn, if I may use that religious expression. If it's not reborn, it will die. It's, it's very simple. And I said, 2024, it will lose elections. I said this during the local government of Zuma. And when he used too much of the clever blacks, and I was attacked. But the results were. What they were. That's when the erosion of power started in the municipal level. We're begging EFF in Johannesburg to vote with us in Pretoria. We're on our knees. Is that how it should be? Maybe that's how it should be if you are not doing the right thing. You beg for power. And sometimes they'll tell go to hell, like they told us in Kurudeni, in Johannesburg, in Pretoria, and that's my dad. They said to the NC, you can go to hell. To govern without you. And that is a punishment of democracy for people for, 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 by the people. What was the second question? About politicians who stay on for many years, not so. Yeah, like, they are not being reshuffled. Yeah, but that's the mm -hmm. There are some people in the National Assembly who are not even qualified for the roles that they are in. People who do not have the degrees, they do not have the experience. Like I can make an example with the uh, Minister of Defense. She has no experience whatsoever, but she is the Minister of Defense. How does that work? <laughs> the struggles the, the, the as produced for us <laughs> who find themselves in those positions. Sorry. We should, it's a different discussion. 
Well, what should qualify one to be represent the public? The bigger person. We should we should go back to that question again. You know, um, in the past, and I point us more how high you can join, how many black people and gold shirts you should wear, but it should change. It should change. But if there's a good minister in the cabinet, I'll keep that minister rather than have a wrong one. But it sends a wrong message when someone is tired and keep them there. You must give them time to go and enjoy their lives. When Mandela came out of jail, he was very old. He served the first five years and he said to us, guys, I need to enjoy my life. And there are those in the party who say, yes, he's right. Give him time to also be a human being, not the president. There are those who say, no, we are afraid Tabon Beg will follow him. And therefore, he must stay on. So, so he must stay at his own expense. I'm just sharing some of this thing with you. Those who are too old, they must take salute and go and guide the young ones to take power. That's what should happen. But those who have no skills, it's a bigger question. We need to address it. All parties, NC, DA, everyone, they must say, you think state agency has got the it's got capacity, intellectual? Yeah, it doesn't really have a metric. That is why I was saying that. It seems like there's no other party to go for as well, because the one with the red party, it seems like we need to And then the blue party, it just seems like we're going back to another system that we just have power. Yeah, but the people will decide which party must be born from this chaos. Chaos creates creativity. It does. Uh, but um, another point on your question, uh, what I have noticed is that um, uh, people who are in high offices, they often uh, select uh, cabinet ministers on the basis of the support that they can get from them in the provinces where they come from. I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say out there, but I agree with you that the politicians must be people who have gone to school, who have yeah. got degrees and who understand what is happening. Yeah. If you look at the, the Communist Party of uh, China, uh, Xi Jinping uh, has a master's. It was trained, he has got a doctorate, but no, he was involved in a lot of plagiarism as well. <laughs> in his doctoral thesis. So it was crap, he doesn't have a PhD. But um, if you look at all of the leaders uh, in, in, in uh, the Communist Party uh, conference, there are people who have gone to school. They are, they've got PhDs in chemistry, in mechanical engineering, so on and so forth. So when they are deployed, uh, to head departments, then they know what it is that they are doing. There was, although it was said in jest, it was a joke. There was a comparison of um, our uh, Minister of Defense, Patricia Natura, and the Secretary of Defense in uh, the US. I forget his name, but that guy has got a master's Austin. in military matters. Austin. Austin, yes, he has got a master's in military matters. But Patricia Natura has got a, a PH. A, you know, PH is the old. A teacher's a diploma, primary higher teacher's certificate, <laughs> PhD. Very old day, long before we could even think that we were going to uh, exist. Now she's a minister of uh, defense. Now it begs the question about uh, the type of um, competency we've got in government. There is a great lag as far as that is concerned. Uh, to get to uh, the young lady's uh, 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 question, we've got a serious problem of corruption in our country. Jobs are politicized in our country. You won't, get, you won't be able to get a job uh, in government if you are not uh, politically uh, uh, connected. You know, in 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 China, uh, before 1994, and this was a joke that was said uh, among people. Uh, we didn't have um, uh, a noticeable number of Kosa speaking uh, people, but once. They became a president. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, are, there are even suburbs now where you only find closer to him people. Uh, this is the problem that you've got in uh, our country. We've got to get rid of it. takes us back at what uh, Dr. Bosa has said. The provinces that we have in our country are bound to states and they are going to perpetuate this tribalism and it is going to go along with. Uh, the jobs that you've got in the country. Yeah. Um, there was, um, I used to do a lot of work in uh, government uh, before training uh, government uh, servants. Uh, we we'll go to a particular environment, for example. If you go to environment, we are going to find a lot of uh, vendor speaking uh, people out there, simply because uh, rejoice. 
was the Minister of uh, Environment. And Rejoice was our librarian when we were students at the University of <laughs> the North. So a lot of vendor speaking people, you find them in the Department of Environment. And this is the sickness that we have got in our country, and it must come to an end. Speaking of things coming to an end, unfortunately, we are also out of time today. We could go on, but I think the big issue is that we all have a duty to do something. Yeah. Thank you very much to my two panelists, and thank you to everyone who joined us in the venue and also online. I want to take the opportunity to thank all of you for being present at this afternoon. This must have been a very exciting opportunity for all of us. I want to thank in particular our guest of honor, uh, Dr. Bosa. Uh, he came with a blast uh, of a speech. We don't generally expect uh, politicians or people who have been politicians to come here and talk truth uh, to uh, power. But we thank him uh, for the great uh, input that he has made. I hope that it is going to change the way in which we think about politics in uh, our country. I want to thank our referee uh, out here uh, for coming up with all these difficult questions <laughs> that uh, our guest speaker was unable to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, uh, for making our afternoon at our university to be so interesting at uh, this afternoon. We hope that in future we'll have similar people coming out there. You know, um, just uh, last week, a government issued a directive at the Department of uh, Higher Education that if a university does not, among other things, engage in this kind of activity so that they contribute to the development of the people, it will be downgraded to a college. So we must have more and more of this kind of addresses so that we can uh, improve the thinking of uh, our students, the thinking of our staff members, and uh, the general public uh, at large. Thank you very much uh, for being with us.